Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I am the legendary Savak, joined by nobody, but that's alright. Uh, today we're going to go ahead and start with a uh, quick moment to honor Tina Tinter and her um, canine companion, whose lives were tragically cut short by the very, very foolish decisions made by Mr. Henry Ruggs. It is a goddamn shame what transpired there, and uh, my heart goes out to her family, and unfortunately, Henry deserves everything that comes his way, uh, which the last time I checked was potentially up to 40-something years. Damn, dude. I, I hope it was worth it. I really do. But um, that whole thing makes me wonder, you know, what did the Raiders do to the football gods? They really must have done something to piss them off. Because they... How does that happen? They've just been dealt these two massive blows after starting the season looking like they were finally poised to do something good, you know? Uh, first, an investigation completely unrelated, you know, that uh, they're investigating Washington's workplace. Somehow, 650,000 emails come out and John Gruden is the only one that gets in trouble? Something here doesn't add up. Uh, I, I don't know what that, there's an old dodge for that, I don't know what it is, something about smelling, if it smells, I, you know, it doesn't matter. But regardless, how the hell is John Gruden the only one that catches flack for that? He's forced to resign in shame. Which, you know, I don't even care what he said. My thing is, you're doing an investigation that has nothing to do with him. What the hell does investigating Washington's toxic workplace have to do with John Gruden? How does that turn into blowing up in his face? You know? Doesn't make any damn sense. Either way, so he's gone. They actually start playing a little better, which is a little surprising, but awesome. Uh, they do seem a little bit more relaxed. And then this happens. Henry Ruggs. Holy flippin' hell, man. Um... Whatever y'all gotta do, I don't know, go sage your stadium, uh, if you must, I guess, sacrifice a goat or a lamb, I, I don't know, it, it depends on your religious beliefs, uh, but y'all you, gotta do something, or maybe they just gotta keep playing, I don't know. Well, we'll circle back to them a little later. So anyways, as for Miami, tread day... <laughs> As for Miami, the trade deadline came and went, and Deshaun Watson it did not become a Miami Dolphin, and for good reason, you know, uh, it, well, 22, 23 good reasons. <laughs> uh, regardless, still left the fan base nice and divided right on down the middle. Some people, I, while I understand, look, he was a top five quarterback last year, and that was without DeAndre Hopkins, and he could probably do a lot of things for our franchise but he won't fix all the problems. All it would effectively do, especially given the compensation that would have been required to get him, would turn us into Houston for the last few years, where they're playoff contenders, but they never really get anything done. They always find themselves back there going, okay, maybe next year will be our year. Which we're already feeling that way anyways, but it wouldn't solve all of the issues, especially not considering we've just had breakdowns all up and down this team, specifically on the offensive side of the ball. Now, one interesting thing to note was that uh, Stephen Ross did take the time to meet with Deshaun Watson. I think it was the day or night before the trade deadline, which is very interesting because uh, while the trade did not go through, what it suggests is that we might have the inside track for trying to get make a play at him in the offseason. And the word around the campfire, as everybody knows, is that Deshaun Watson's preferred destination is Miami. In fact, that one dude who initially reported that the trade could go down last week, I can't remember his name, is it like John McClain or something? No, wait, that, that's Bruce Willis from Die Hard, right? It, it doesn't matter. But that guy reported that the reason that Will Fuller signed with Miami was because he was expecting Deshaun to end up down there. I don't know how true that is. I wouldn't f in there. And this man's a lot more uh, plugged in than I am, so I, I suppose there's a little bit of credence to it. Regardless, it didn't go down this year, and it's to his team for the rest of the season, barring injury. And I hope he balls out, because he really he's going to need to. He's basically playing for his career at this point, not just necessarily with the Dolphins, which kind of looks like he might be on the way out. Uh, but 
he's playing for uh, his resume for the next team so that somebody else can take a look at him and be like, you know what, I think we can do something with this. You know, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of another quarterback, who, and I'm kind of surprised that the comp has not been made up to this point. You know, a fellow undersized quarterback whose career got off to a rocky start, even though actually Tua looks better, especially on paper and in the numbers, he looks better early on than this guy did. But this guy, this guy's career did not get off to a great start, and he ended up having to go somewhere else to somebody else, a different coaching coach and coaching staff that better exemplified and accentuated his strengths. And uh, just so happens, this dude was also a slightly undersized slightly mobile, not exactly the most athletic, but left-handed quarterback. I'm talking about Steve Young. Now, for those of y'all that don't remember Steve Young, uh, you know, I probably even shouldn't because I was quite young at the time, but <laughs> uh, Steve Young sat behind Joe Montana, Montana, you know, for the, the San Francisco 49ers, and um, once he got his opportunity, he came out and he shined. Now, he initially entered the league, I believe he entered as a Tampa Bay Buccaneer and was widely considered a bust while he was there. So when he went to San Francisco, uh, his coach, he was reunited with a college coach of his, Mike Holmgren, who kind of knew how to get the best out of him. And he waited, bided his time. He's a sharp dude, and he was a hard worker. He kept his nose down, or kept his head down, nose in the playbook. And when his time came, he shined. Now, one advantage that Tua's got over him is that Tua is a more pal. <laughs> I, I can't talk today. Tua is a more polished passer than Steve was at that point in his career. So Tua's kind of got the leg up, and I have no doubt that if he were to go somewhere else. Uh, say uh, New Orleans that a coach like that would be able to get the most out of him having a little bit of experience working with a quarterback that's kind of like that and it's funny actually because uh, <laughs> Sean Payton actually referred to Taysom Hill as his Steve Young which you know a lot of us kind of laughed at it's like I don't know if maybe you mean that they both went to BYU alright I'll give you that Taysom went to BYU right pretty sure Somebody look that up. Yeah, he went to BYU. <laughs> so, um, unless that's a connection that you're making, nobody else particularly saw what the hell he was talking about. But uh, if he were to land himself a Dua, I think that he would be able to get exactly what he was expecting out of Taysom Hill. Maybe a little more. Uh, well, at least as a quarterback. Taysom Hill's still light years faster than Tua, but that's neither here nor there. But I am surprised that nobody's made that connection before. But the, the biggest thing that I want to take from that is that Steve needed something in particular to be successful. He needed that system that better accentuated his strengths, that uh, allowed him to be himself and, you know, play within his game, if that makes any sense. You know, now, just like Steve, Tua doesn't necessarily have the strongest arm. He's, got an all right arm, he can make all throws, and they'll get down there. They might not get down there as fast as some other quarterbacks throwing it, but they'll get there. And I, I think that a uh, more West Coast leaning offense might help fix some of those issues that we've seen. Uh, you know, people want to call him Tua turn the ball over. Man, that's not nice. <laughs> even if it is accurate. It's not even so much that he's turning the ball over a whole lot. It's just the particular moments that he picks to do it. I know he's not picking to do that. Picking when to throw picks. Whatever. Uh, but I think a, a better offense might fix that. A better scheme. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a West Coast offense. It just has to be something that could be built around somebody who doesn't necessarily have a cannon for an arm. Now, I had previously come up with a list of offensive coordinators that I liked. Uh, there's a video on it up on my channel. you got to go look for it. I, I, I'm f***ing back there. But either way, I have actually added somebody to that list, and he might have risen to the top of that list at this point. Um, now, this man has excelled and he kind of rocketed his way up to becoming an offensive coordinator and QB coach. Uh, he has worked with a couple, uh, I don't know about notable, but he's worked with quarterbacks who didn't necessarily have the strongest arms. He worked with quarterbacks who may be slightly undersized. He worked with a Hawaiian lefty, believe it or not. And uh, each year his offenses rank among the top 10. Now he 
went from UCF where he coached Mackenzie Milton, who didn't have necessarily the long, longest, huh? who didn't necessarily have the strongest arm, and is currently having his last year of eligibility wasted on FSU's bench. So, you know, thanks, Mike Norvell. Very nice. I'm glad you got your problems sorted out, but, uh, you know, you still kind of f***ing up his future. I mean, not necessarily. You know, Casey has always long said that he wants to become a coach after his playing career is done, but I think he was hoping to at least get a shot in the NFL uh, before having to become a coach. But he's going to be a damn good coach because uh, his influence in FSU's locker room is palpable. It is noticeable. You see the the uh, progress that's being made by their quarterbacks. His presence is, oh, my goodness. So I can't wait to see him as a coach. He's going to probably rapidly shoot up the ranks, too, and um, it's going to be really great to watch. It's been a hell of a journey, you know, especially after making that comeback, that very unlikely comeback from a catastrophic injury to coming in and almost beating Notre Dame in week one of the college football season. My God, I was standing there. I could not sit down. I was uh, biting my nails, basically. My wife was laughing at me because she's like, it's like you're watching. It's like he's your son. I'm like, I know. It kind of feels like it. But uh, really great story. It would, if they would have won that game, Disney would have optioned that shit as a movie immediately. But uh, unfortunately, they fell short. It wasn't necessarily his fault. I think... Uh, a lot of things played into that, and it's mostly Mike Norvell's fault, but we're not here to talk about that. Anyways, this guy coached up that man. He also coached up the backup, the left-handed Hawaiian passer, Dylan Gabriel, and as a freshman, got this kid to post some pretty high marks. Following his time at UCF, he was then hired by Ole Miss to also be the offensive coordinator and QB coach. And in his first year, the offense ranked seventh in the nation in total offense, and uh, it earned him an extension and a significant pay bump. And so, um, as a result, if you want to see his handiwork, go look them up. Look up Ole Miss. Go watch them. Matt Corral looks like a bona fide pro. We can go ahead and do a profile on this man. I'm talking about Jeff Levy. I, can, I guess I can reveal his name. <laughs> uh, we can go ahead and do a profile on him later if you guys are interested. But um, the short version is he has a way of turning around offenses and getting production. He has a tendency to get the most out of the run game. He has coached several um, thousand-yard rushers, including Baylor's first back-to-back thousand-yard rushers, and the running game is an emphasis in his offense, as well as aggressive play calling, which, of course, these two things are lacking in Miami, so I would love to see him and what he could do with what we have. So that's Jeff Levy. Yeah. Yeah, that's my new. Now, of course, if you guys saw that video that I did on my other offensive coordinator candidates, <laughs> then you guys know that a few of them actually come from the same coaching tree. That would be uh, Mr. Art Bryles, formerly disgraced Baylor head coach, who, you know, he got ousted after there was a bunch of, I think it was a sex scandal. I don't really want to get into all that. But, uh, yeah, he, Jeff Levy's actually from that coaching tree. Like I said, he coached uh, the running backs there at Baylor for a few years, and I think he was able to do some other stuff. Doesn't matter. Uh, but I like the guys from that tree because that offense is very potent, and there's a lot of little things, little details within it that make it so good, so palpable. You know, there's little bits of misdirection. Aside from the motioning and stuff, there's tiny little things like... Uh, Almost every single play is either a play action or an RPO, and the quarterback, if he does hand the ball off, will usually drop back and do a quick throw motion as if he threw a screen or a quick slant or something. Just little things to get the defense to jump and go the wrong direction. It's amazing. I love this sort of thing. I first noticed it when he was at UCF, and you, you witnessed uh, Mackenzie Milton doing that sort of thing, and it was like, yo, whoa, he, he just fooled me and the camera guy with that, you know? And little things like that go a long way. And uh, we don't see that a whole lot of that sort of thing in Miami's offense, and that's what we need. We need some innovation. We need some uh, some movement. We need uh, some creativity. The love of God. Which, anyways, pushes me ahead to <clears throat> tomorrow's game because it is Saturday. Uh, tomorrow's game against Houston. Houston will come to town, and I just read that. Oh, Terod Taylor is back. Oh well. Don't even know why we bothered. F***ing thing. 
You're gonna be stuck, man. It's over. We're finished. Nah, I'm just kidding. You know, but I do actually have a great deal of respect for Terod Taylor, and I believe that had he not gotten hurt, Houston's record would probably be a lot better. Because uh, if you witnessed, I know they what they played, they beat Jacksonville. I get, I get that it's Jacksonville and that they have not been good at all this season. But uh, that offense looked a lot more competent with Terod Taylor uh, behind the wheel because Terod is competent. I've always had uh, I've always had a love for that man. I don't know what it is. Something about the way he just comes in and he's a consummate professional. He comes in, he works hard, he does his job, and now he's kind of been caught in this cycle of becoming a bridge quarterback, where he's good enough, you know. But everybody always brings him in. They use him as a bridge. They draft their new guy and then they just kick him to the curb. All right, thanks, T. Get the fuck out now. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, don't don't let the door hit you on the as you exit through the gift shop, you know, and, <laughs> oh man, like Buffalo, that's the saddest thing ever, man, uh, how, how's this man gonna take y'all to your first playoff appearance in like 20 years, and you're like, all right, hey, thanks, bye, we drafted our new guy, and then they, that cycle just continued on to Cleveland, and then they, all right, hey, we just drafted our new guy, thanks, bye, you know, but, at least that year, he was there until he got hurt, and then that's when Baker had to step in and became the new starter. And now, you know, then he goes, oh my god, then he goes to the Chargers, and they trapped, okay, we drafted Justin Herbert, oops, doctor punctured your lung with a f***ing syringe, so, uh, <laughs> oh, I guess Herbert's the guy now, bye! And then on to Houston, where he gets hurt. And now, I mean, they don't, Davis Mills is not any of those other aforementioned quarterbacks, uh, very clearly. Uh, no offense to Davis Mills. I'm sure he can develop into a competent backup, which I think is what he'll probably end up being. But damn, man, to Rod. <laughs> And I, I think I would have preferred him over Ryan Fitzpatrick even. I know we have a, a love affair with, with Fitzy, but Terod probably would have, would have taken us farther. That's the funny part, because he turns the ball over way less. But, no, nah, that's neither here nor there. And I'm sure he's happy with his career at this point. You know, he, he got himself a Super Bowl ring. <gasps> People are saying. Like, when did he play in a Super Bowl? Technically, he did, and he was the backup for Baltimore. You know, I think well, when they beat the 49ers. But still, so he's had a good career, and I'm, I'm assuming he'd probably be ready to retire, too, if, uh, if people stopped paying him. But they keep paying him. They keep offering him here. Well, how about a one-year, couple-million-dollar deal? You come in, you know, we're going to draft a new guy, so there's not really any pressure. We're not expecting to win. And he just comes in. He does his work. He teaches the young guys how to do it and moves on. You know, one of these days he's going to ride off into the sunset, and he's just going to... Until then, he's just going to stack his paper boo-boo, and that's cool. <laughs> like I said, he's already got his Super Bowl ring, so sky's the limit for him, man. He's basically on uh, on borrowed time. He's coasting out. That's what I would be doing, potentially. I mean, in his situation, since nobody has wanted to hold on to him as, as the starter. So uh, I'm sure he's just enjoying himself, just like Bitsy. <laughs> Either way, he is back. Uh... The aforementioned Will Fuller, I read, is on IR with a broken finger. By the way, Tua also has an injured finger on his throwing hand, so that's a little concerning. I don't know how bad it is or if it's going to force him out of action uh, tomorrow. And then I read Devontae Parker is back on IR as well after re-aggravating the hamstring injury. Oh, man, I know the fan base is torn on him, and I, I am personally upset because he stopped following me on Twitter some time ago, you know? DVP, I will never let that go. But uh, I was actually in favor of trading him probably a couple seasons back, uh, maybe even a few seasons back, definitely after the breakout year, which I kind of figured was going to be an aberration. You know, we had Perfect Storm in that situation. New offensive coordinator was the former wide receivers coach for the Patriots, who up to that point had spent his career basically taking throwaways and non-receivers and turning them into serviceable all the way to good and really good, potentially great wide receivers. 
such as Julian Edelman, who was a college quarterback that grows on to become the Super Bowl MVP at wide receiver. So uh, I, I don't think it was a coincidence that Devontae Parker had his breakout year that year. And sure enough, the following year when Chad O'Shea left, <laughs> so did DVP's production on that level. So uh, I was in favor of trading him after that when his uh, value was at an all-time high, but we did not. We did not trade him this year, and uh, I just don't know what we're going to do. Uh, speaking of other receivers, though, Preston Williams was left home last week for disciplinary reasons. You would imagine when we've got so many injuries and so many issues with the offense, we would need all the help that we can get. I mean, seriously, what, what is this, Pop Warner? He got in trouble, so you, you're going to go, or you don't get to make the trip with us. You don't get to play this week. Come on, man. And besides, how is that even an issue? Remember, wasn't discipline one of the selling points of Brian Flores' uh, coaching? Remember the TNT wall? Uh, when that thing was up and they, they had to run to the wall when they made stupid mistakes, I mean, it seemed like those mistakes got cut down. We didn't have as many penalties. We didn't have as many fumbles or issues with ball security, things like that. Just stupid mistakes were cut down, and now suddenly that wall does not appear to be a major facet, a major feature at the training facility, and those mistakes are back, so... I don't know. Again, man, the, the discipline, though. I, I, I'm tired of it. That was one of my biggest issues with the last couple of coaching staffs is the lack of discipline. We just looked like we weren't ready the, the team looked like they hadn't been prepared and like they hadn't been playing football their entire f***ing lives. And that is frustrating. So uh, I would love to see that get turned around. So in terms of keys to victory for tomorrow, it's going to be the same as last week. We need to score points. If we can score points, we'll be fine. The defense will be fine. That defense is tenacious and aggressive. And as you guys might have noticed, uh, they can get stops. But they need the offense to match that intensity. Get the ball in the end zone. I'm not even talking about kicking field goals, which it appears that we are also ha having trouble doing. I don't know what the hell happened to King Sanders, but Coach Flo doesn't have as much confidence in him anymore. After this dude was just routinely knocking 50-plus yard uh, field goals through last year, now we, we don't know if he can anymore. So that's wonderful. You know, great. Real great. But that's the key to victory right there. It's going to be scoring points, which of course start down there in the trenches. If the offensive line can protect Tua, he can get the ball to his playmakers. If he can get the ball to his playmakers, they can get the ball in the end zone. I know it sounds simple, and in a way it is, but damn it. We have not been able to do it. <laughs> so that's going to be what it's all about. Uh, this is a very winnable game. You know, Jacksonville should have been the get-right game. We lost that one. This one is the next get right game. We can win this one, fellas. Dial in, okay? Offensive line, protect Tua. You know, stop acting like you've never done this before. I am a little concerned. We dumped all that draft capital in this offensive line, and they just cannot seem to get it together. It does call into question Chris Greer and his decision making. It might be time to start looking for a new general manager. And also, in terms of team building, there's a guy out there who has built great rosters, and uh, I don't know if I would want to make him a general manager because he's been fired two times in a row after building incredible rosters, uh, but it's only because he can't stop tinkering, and that man is John Dorsey. So if you guys don't recall, John Dorsey was with Kansas City and helped build that roster up and was part of drafting Patrick Mahomes and all that. Those guys, Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill, Kareem Hunt, and uh, then he got fired from there, I don't remember what for, and went to Cleveland, where he brought in Baker Mayfield, Nick Chubb, uh, Jarvis Landry, Odell Beckham, uh, Kareem Hunt. <laughs> and unfortunately, he was fired because of foolishness uh, after tinkering way too much with the coaching staff and deciding to make Freddie Kitchens the first-time head coach instead of leaving the system in place that they had that was working. Because I think if they had left what they had in place, Cleveland possibly could have won out. And now that setup was with uh, Greg Williams as the head coach and Freddie Kitchens as the offensive coordinator. By the way, he was calling plays out of Todd Haley's playbook. So I don't understand why the consensus was, we should make Freddie Kitchens the head coach. 
Because trust me, nobody was trying to steal Freddy Kitchens from you. I can assure you of that. Uh, either way, John Dorsey has built up great rosters, so bringing him in as some kind of senior personnel executive would be a great idea, which is why the Lions already did it, so we'd have to probably outbid them, give them a better contract or whatever, something, you know, give them more power. I don't know. But uh, still remains to be seen if he can do it for the Lions, and I'm sure he probably will. I think it's the Lions. Might be Philly. Pretty sure it's the Lions. Either way. That remains to be seen. Uh, I want to thank you guys for sitting and watching through all this stuff. How do you guys think Miami's going to do? How do you think they solved their Miami woes? Do you have any picks for offensive coordinator? And in what direction do you think they should go with quarterback? Let me know in the comments. Be sure to like, subscribe, and tell a friend if you guys enjoyed it. Or if you didn't, doesn't matter. You know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Uh, be sure to check the description for links to some cool stuff. I actually found these rather badass, officially licensed NFL uh, Bluetooth headphones. There's some wireless earbuds. They appear to be pretty uh, high quality and, of course, have your team's logo on them. So get on there. Check them out. Should, links should be down there. Uh, go ahead. Go through it make the purchase and it may help my channel out a little bit and I would greatly appreciate it because I appreciate you viewer because none of this would be possible without you okay yeah <laughs> so for everybody else I am the legendary Savak this is an empty futon and um, I'll see you guys next time